Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second lecture of the day. Uh, my name is Yi, one of the residents at UCSF, and we have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Andrew Cohen this morning, who did his residency training at University of Chicago, and then recently his fellowship with us here at UCSF, and he is now the Director of Trauma and Reconstructive Surgery at Brady Urology at Hopkins. So uh, he's going to speak with, to us about upper tract trauma this morning. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and to uh, be able to speak to you about this topic. Um, I don't have any disclosures. And uh, as, uh, as was already mentioned, um, I did spend some time over in uh, California, did my fellowship uh, there under the tutelage of uh, Dr. Ben Breyer. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's harken back to a time when we could travel and go places and see things and and this is one of the one of the most wonderful things in California. It's the Pacific Coast Highway. Um, for those of you who have never been there, put it on your uh, your list for things to do in 2024 when we're all living in a normal world. Uh, but this is a stretch of uh, of pretty rugged land uh, that meets the sea. Uh, it just uh, smells wonderful. It feels wonderful. The only problem with this area is that uh, there's really not a, a big emphasis on safety. Uh, and as you can see in the picture here, it's just sort of a sheer cliff that drops into the nothingness. And so uh, this is a common, well, you know, not rare news report that you get at times when you live uh, in California and you're near this area. And that's a 53 year old male who presented after a fall from the cliff um, and estimated a 30, Foot fall. So we're going to talk about this case um, and uh, and how it uh, can illustrate some of the key uh, factors for renal trauma. And uh, hopefully you guys will be able to learn something from all of that. So uh, we're going to first uh, talk about prior times. You already did that. Wax poetically about Pacific Coast Highway. Done. Uh, now we're going to start by reviewing for your impending redeployment to the emergency room. And then after that, we'll talk about guideline-based renal trauma care. I want to talk about some of the evidence uh, behind those guidelines. And then I want to talk about some of the new and upcoming uh, research topics that are in this area uh, and how it may impact uh, how you think about the treatment of uh, renal trauma uh, moving forward. So back to our case. So let's pretend that like you're one of these first responder emergency room physicians. Uh, who's, you know, sitting down here evaluating the situation. We're all sort of uh, potentially doing new roles. Um, and so let's uh, kind of be the emergency room physician for the sake of education here. And, uh, and when you are facing any sort of patient uh, who is suffered from a trauma, there's a protocol that exists. It's well documented, well studied, that's, you know, can come up and it's important for everybody to know. And uh, before we get to that, I kind of want to get a sense of what we're all doing out there. Are we all still doing urology? Are we all doing other things? So if we could throw the first poll up. Okay, so uh, I, I think everyone can see the poll results, but over half of us may be redeployed. Uh, a very small percentage, 10%, have already been redeployed and 35%, no, no discussion. So we all therefore should be prepared to, to be the emergency room physician. And so for any trauma situation, uh, the A, B, C, D, E, a pathway, or sort of essentially the primary survey is really key for evaluating the trauma patient. Um, and in a little more uh, detail here, um, the A is referring to the airway, both that it's sort of open and that the spine is immobilized and protected. Uh, the B is for breathing, of course, to so make sure that the patient uh, has uh, oxygen and that there is air moving in and out of the airway. Uh, C is, re is regarding the circulation. So easy way to assess that is by checking for pulses. Uh, at that point, you also can establish an IV access. 
Uh, and depending on the situation, you may be considering getting blood or saline in the area, getting ready to go. Uh, the D stands for disability, and it is referring specifically to a patient's neurologic function. And you assess that uh, in various uh, means, but you know you can use a, a light to engage the pupils, uh, and you can use various scoring systems to assess for neurologic impairment. Uh, e is for exposure, so you want to get a good look at the patient's skin. Uh, you want at the same time to maintain their body temperature and warm them. Uh, and there's a continu continual uh, iterative process here with these trauma assessments. So you're going to continue to monitor them uh, as you put on uh, our newest and best technologies uh, to make sure that they're still safe. So then you usually are able to move on to the secondary survey at that point, and that is a more detailed assessment of each body system. Uh, you know, head to toe, uh, doing even a, a log roll and doing a, a back exam, including a, a rectal exam. Um, and usually if, you, if it's been a while since you've been in one of these trauma situations, this is usually a team effort, uh, and there's various clinicians that are uh, speaking aloud uh, the exam for each body system, and then somebody is sort of writing down the results into one uh, sort of centralized uh, medical record. And then at that time, the initial plan is formulated and communicated. It's important to know that um, maybe because of the chaos, maybe because of the design, you know, 50% of the time, uh, primary and secondary surveys may miss injuries. And it's a key to recall the tertiary survey, which is a comprehensive review of the medical record uh, with an emphasis on the, the trauma uh, and what took place and the mechanism of action of that trauma. And that is done when the patient is more awake, uh, when they're able to communicate with you, and typically you aim to do that within 24 hours. This is the, the Glasgow uh, Coma Score, and uh, unfortunately the rumor that it was crafted in a bar in Glasgow to describe the level of drunkenness of the uh, participants in the bar are not true. Uh, but it uh, is used in order to uh, ascertain the level of neurologic impairment of patients undergoing a trauma. Uh, and, you know, a higher score is better. Um, you guys keep uh, the verbal response of me personally in mind throughout the lecture. If you get, if we get down to a level two, uh, then that's a problem. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to stick with an oriented uh, Dr. Cohen here. Um, but ultimately, you're able to very quickly assess this in any sort of trauma patient, and that can uh, really be helpful in uh, risk stratifying patients. Uh, there's a number of different scores that you may see in the trauma literature that are going to come up later today as we talk about some of the evidence in the trauma literature. Uh, one of them is the injury severity scale. Uh, and this is, again, is a similar scale, uh, except the numbers are reversed. Now, a zero is better and a higher number is bad. And this is scored um, for each of these body systems that you can see here on the left. And uh, for some reason, they, uh, they were fans of the Pythagorean theorem and they have this sort of quasi Pythagorean theorem method to calculate the total ISS score. So you pick the three worst body regions and you square the number that you get from this previous page, zero to six, and then you add it all up. Um, so, there are other scores, the RTS score, there's also the Apache scoring system, and then you can also combine all these scoring systems into sort of like an adjunct scoring system. But the reason why these are useful and they stick around is because they do uh, predict uh, mortality, both in patients that have had uh, trauma in a vehicle and trauma just in some other cause. And so, for example, on this table, you can see that, you know, for a cutoff of 24, um, you know, 61% of patients in a, a vehicle trauma may have a mortality. Um, and so that's a, a very predictive number uh, that can be very helpful from, you know, you're not going to calculate that while you're, you're dealing with the patient in the, in the here and now, but it can be very helpful for a research perspective and improving the trauma care for these patients uh, moving forward prospectively and retrospectively. So let's go back to our, our trauma. This is, again, a 53-year-old guy. He fell off this cliff. He fell 30 feet. He has bilateral open femur fractures. Again, for those of us, it's been a while since we've been on our orthopedic rotation or in the emergency room. An open fracture is one that has uh, penetrated the skin, so it's, it's uh, clinically more apparent. 
um, and he has these bilaterally. Uh, he is also hypotensive through the 60s, systolics. He has an elevated heart rate. Uh, oxygenation is okay. Respiratory rate is a, a bit elevated. On physical exam, uh, he has a pretty good neurologic exam. He again has uh, open femur fractures. I know everyone's dying to know because we're in neurology. Foley was placed, there was no gross hematuria. Uh, he did get labs around the time that he arrived. Uh, white blood cell count was elevated, hemoglobin 14.6, platelets 219, creatinine uh, within normal limits. So he's in 10 out of 10 pain. Uh, he doesn't recall a loss of consciousness. Uh, he says the cliff collapsed under his feet. And uh, you're able to ascertain that he has a history of asthma, but otherwise he's in a little too much pain to uh, get you, for you to get any additional exam information at this time. So you're the ER physician, you've been repurposed for COVID. What, what do you do now? Well, um, you know, we are sometimes cynical about the emergency room getting CT scans on everybody who walks in the door. But in the case of trauma, uh, there is very high quality evidence that cross-sectional imaging actually saves lives. Um, and so this is one situation where uh, uh, blunt trauma in particular, uh, getting a whole body CT scan is very fruitful. Uh, and is going to uncover things that can really positively impact the patient's uh, recovery uh, long term. So, um, so again, it's easy to be cynical, but in the trauma situation, this is evidence-based and protocol-based, and that's why pretty much all traumas have uh, very aggressive and early imaging as soon as the primary and secondary survey are, are complete. Um, so our patient, uh, you know, kind of, you know, because you are a very good emergency room resident, you stabilized him and then you brought him to the CT scanner. Um, and so this is the CT scan. So I'll cycle through it a few times and then I'm gonna ask you to, to uh, answer a question for me. But you know, obviously we're a urologist. So take a look at the, uh, the kidneys and the, the ureters if you can spot them. All right, why don't we throw up that, that uh, poll? And uh, I, got, I got the perfect musical accompaniment. Okay, so 42% uh, grade one, 30% uh, NA. All right, very good. So uh, I would strongly argue that there is no evidence of any sort of uh, renal laceration or hematoma on this patient. Uh, and the patient has pretty much perfectly normal kidneys. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll talk in more detail about that. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, uh, probably I would put six on a board exam, NA. So the patient is brought emergently with orthopedics for external fixation, as is appropriate given the, uh, the bilateral open femur fractures. And the patient uh, is noted at this time to have an ongoing transfusion requirement. So uh, when they first arrived, hemoglobin was 14.6, but over the ensuing hours, the hemoglobin uh, dropped uh, pretty dramatically. And they received ultimately 15 units of blood platelets FFP for eight liters total of product. And this is a picture of uh, external fixation. These are rods that are placed external uh, to the bone to, to reapproximate it. So what's, is this level of blood loss or the need for eight liters of product, is that sort of in line with what you'd expect for a bilateral femal, femur fracture? Uh, and that, that's a good question. Um, and so this is, a, this is an article that, that tries to address that. Um, and so, for patients with a, a femoral sh shaft fracture, about a third of them, you know, 29%, ultimately received some product. And they received a median of, of two uh, units of RBCs per patient. And of those that got blood, about 17% of them got more than five units. Um, and so this article is regarding a, a single femoral shaft fracture. We're talking about a patient with 
bilateral fractures. Um, and so, you know, it, is it sort of on the extremis of, of the amount of blood that you'd expect? Maybe, but it's not sort of out of the question that all the blood loss could be coming from the uh, orthopedic uh, injury and subsequent uh, repair of that injury. But, you know, obviously it's a question mark. It's not sort of, uh, you know, not all patients with that level of blood loss would be ascribed just to orthopedic injury. So there was still a lingering concern. Um, and so the next step was to uh, re-image the patient a few hours later. So this was just a quick sort of non-con scan. So why don't we throw up another poll? Okay, so uh, now we have um, uh, sort of a, a, a split between grade one and grade two injury. Okay, so let's look at the, the scan uh, a little bit closer, and we're also going to review the injury score. So going back to the original scan, uh, I stated for you that this was a non-scorable, perfectly healthy kidney. But if you, if you do zoom in, which I don't know if you guys were able to do, there's this little bleb here, right off the side of the left kidney, right here. And the question is, is that just a simple cyst or does that represent uh, a, a, uh, some sort of subcapsular uh, hematoma? Really hard to say. Um, and, uh, but again, all things being equal, especially if this was the type of picture you got on your board exam, uh, I would not expect anyone to uh, identify this as a, uh, as a renal injury. This, these are normal kidneys sort of at, you know, at, at first approximation. Whether this represents something real or not, uh, hindsight may be more informing us than the image quality. Um, and then on the newest scan, uh, this to me, this is a grade one uh, renal injury. I do not see any laceration proper uh, on the uh, kidney itself because the line around the kidney parenchyma is pretty much fixed in place. Um, and so it's just a subcapsular hematoma to me, and we'll talk more in detail about how to grade these appropriately. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about this scan is it reveals a new finding that was not on the first one, which is this contrast is all the way up on the flanks bilaterally. So that represents some of the blood loss from the uh, femoral uh, fractures, and it's tracking at least up to the level of the kidney. So there has been significant blood loss from that uh, portion of the uh, injury. So what is, let's, let's take a step back. What is guideline appropriate urologic imaging for uh, these situations? Um, and based on the guidelines, uh, IV contrast enhanced CTs is appropriate for blunt trauma patients that have gross hematuria or patients that have microscopic hematuria and low systolic blood pressure, okay? So the, the negative is not said, but essentially that means that if you have a patient that has microscopic hematuria and no vital sign abnormalities and no other concerning findings, you don't necessarily need to get an IV contrast CT scan for, your, the, for evaluating the kidneys. The other reason to get a CT scan with IV contrast is for physical exam findings or mechanism of injury. So that someone that has a big flank hematoma, somebody that has an injury that struck the flank or they had a fall or they have a rib fracture, that would be another reason sort of irrespective of the blood or the blood pressure to get a CT scan. And, and why is that? Well, it's based on an article by Dr. Makinich and Brandis that's a classic article uh, that they looked at a, of almost 400 of their renal uh, trauma cases and they found that a third of the grade two to four renal injuries didn't have gross hematuria, didn't have microscopic hematuria, didn't have shock. Uh, and so you, you don't want to miss these. 
And the reason that they identified them was because of the fact that they were a fall. And so the mechanism of, of the injury is important. And they also found an interesting thing, which is the height of the fall didn't um, predict the, the degree of injury as well as you might expect. So 10% of blood trauma ultimately involves some sort of kidney injury, and it is nine times more common than penetrating trauma. Uh, patients with renal injury most likely have had a motor vehicle accident or they've had a fall. And now let's kind of talk about the grading system here. So originally, as devised by uh, Dr. Moore, Makinich, and uh, Remanovsky back in the basically late 80s, uh, and it has been updated by uh, Dr. Makinich and, uh, and a, a, a trauma group uh, more recently. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk about the pictures in a moment, but let's first kind of look at the words here associated um, with this. This is a prime table that's tested on board exams because it's sort of easy to memorize uh, and easy to generate questions on the minutia. Um, I would say that there's a few key things that you gotta remember in your head, and then the rest of the table, you'll sort of figure it out. You don't have to memorize everything on here. So, you know, the things, the key things to remember is the one centimeter rule. And then the second thing to remember is that grade four is where you start getting into the collecting system. And pretty much, you know, you can fill in the blanks from there. So grade one, there's no laceration, there's no collecting system injury, there's just some sort of contusion or subcapsular hematoma on the kidney. Grade two is a laceration that's less than a centimeter in depth, okay? No collecting system injury. Grade three, it's a laceration that's greater than one centimeter in depth. Again, no collecting system injury. Grade four is where you have a laceration that gets so deep that it involves a collecting system. It is a vascular segmental vein or artery injury. Uh, and again, it, the, it can be a complete ureteral uh, disruption. Um, or uh, any sort of urinary extravasation. And then a grade five is essentially, you know, the, the kidney looks absolutely terrible. It's a main uh, artery or vein laceration or an avulsion or an arterial or venous thrombus of the kidney. So the, the changes that essentially were made between the old and the new system uh, were regarding the, the vascular uh, vein and artery injury. That's an added detail for grade four. Um, and, uh, and a resorting of where the main arterial or vein laceration injury went into grade five. So it sort of, it changed the composition of the grade four and five injuries somewhat. Um, and uh, if we look at how these scales uh, perform, and th their point is to predict which kidneys are gonna need intervention. That's sort of the idea behind the scale. And so validating this, uh, Dr. Buckley and her group, uh, they compared the original to the new grades and it shouldn't come a shock to anybody that the new grading system did better at predicting the ultimate management of the kidneys. But I think a more important um, uh, point from this article is that 70% of the CT findings, CT reports, did not mention an AAST grade, despite the fact that there was a grade reported for the other organs. So I, that's sort of a part of the story in telling that Urologists have, uh, I think, a strong voice in this space to help add something to the discussion and, have, and help our colleagues in trauma and radiology um, sort of best manage these renal traumas. Uh, because they, you know, even at a, a trauma center uh, with one of the you know, top urologists in the world, the radiologists aren't uh, putting the grades into the CT scans for, to help guide the management. So pictorially, this is sort of what the table uh, shows. So for people that are more uh, visual learners, grade one, this is a subcapsular hematoma uh, that doesn't have any obvious laceration in the kidney. Grade two, this is a laceration that's less than one centimeter. Grade three is a laceration that's greater than one centimeter. Again, grade one, two, or three, there's no urinary system involvement. Grade four, it's a big laceration that's so deep it goes into the collecting system. And it can involve a subsegmental vein or artery or an avulsion of the ureter completely. And grade five is an arterial thrombosis or complete venous disruption or an avulsion of the hilum uh, injury. So again, to review this, uh, you know, this picture, it's a subcapsular hematoma to me, a grade one injury, uh, and, uh, and that's what I'm sticking to. So there are some special cases to know that can come up 
The gold black kidney is hypertension that results from renal artery occlusion. And a page kidney is hypertension that can result due to the compression of the renal parenchyma, either uh, from a traumatic or non-traumatic subcapsular hematoma. Sometimes uh, the treatment for this is a laparoscopic unroofing of the hematoma and or just a, a nephrectomy. And uh, typically these are done in a delayed fashion uh, if it is or is not related to trauma. So what are the AUA trauma guidelines for managing patients with renal trauma? Uh, so the first thing is, is that non-invasive strategies in stable patients should be pursued. Uh, you, however, in unstable patients, especially with no response or transient response to resuscitation, you should perform some sort of intervention, whether it's surgery or angioembolization. Uh, for patients that do have some urinary extravasation, uh, observation is a reasonable first course. And CT imaging, when do you need to re-image these patients? So for higher grade injuries, four or five, or for patients with some complications that develop over the subsequent day or so. So someone that starts fine and they develop a fever or they start having new abdominals distension, those patients should be re-imaged. And then if you do notice or suspect that the problems with the patient are due to urinary extravasation that's ongoing, excuse me, that's ongoing, then a uh, ureteral stent and or a percutaneous uh, urinoma drain or nephrostomy should be uh, pursued for those cases where you expect uh, urinoma or uh, continued urinary extravasation. So regarding the idea of non-operative management, um, you know, why, how, why and how has that become sort of the mainstay of initial treatment? Um, if you look at sort of a summary of all the best evidence that's out there, uh, patients, it favors, mortality favors those patients where non-operative management is pursued. Um, and there isn't much difference in terms of complications, but the other thing that's pretty obvious is if you favor non-operative management, you're much more likely to have renal preservation, okay? I mean, everyone I think has heard that if you do, you know, in a trauma situation, if you start an operation on the kidney with the intent to do a partial nephrectomy or some sort of a salvage operation, there's a pretty good chance that that kidney is going to end up in the bucket. Uh, and that's just because of the nature of trauma and the nature of some of these injuries. Uh, it can be challenging to get a repair that is, uh, that it doesn't continue to have um, uh, ongoing bleeding. Um, and so, uh, this may just be uh, a proxy for, you know, if you are able to avoid a more invasive uh, operation with more blood loss, your patient's going to do better. So I actually favor the European guidelines on the management of renal trauma. I think that they're a little more detailed and they provide you a little more uh, sort of, uh, you know, roadmap on how you could deal with these patients. And so I, I would, you know, urge even some of our um, American colleagues to take a, a gander at these because I think it can really help everyone understand how best to evaluate these situations. So sort of the first important situation to discover is, is the patient in your consideration stable or unstable? So <clears throat> if they're stable and they don't have hematuria and they don't have a uh, mechanism of action that's worrisome and they don't have low blood pressure because they're stable, then you can observe them, okay? If they do have a mechanism of action like a fall that's concerning, they should get a picture. If they have hematuria, they should get a picture. The picture is gonna result in a few things. It's gonna show that there's no active bleeding. In that case, you're able to grade the injury. For low grade injuries, they should be observed, consider bed rest, serial hemoglobin, et cetera. If there is uh, no active bleeding, but they have a higher grade injury, you should observe them. Uh, and then depending on, uh, situation, you should repeat imaging. Uh, and then if there's a urinary leak, you can consider stenting, etc. If a patient has active bleeding on a CT scan, they can be considered for uh, angioembolization. Uh, if that's not available, they can be considered for an immediate exploration. Uh, in this guidelines, a penetrating grade five injury, they recommend immediate exploration. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then obviously for an unstable patient, you can immediately send them to IR or uh, to the OR, depending on the situation. So let's talk just very briefly about penetrating trauma. Um, there is a growing um, uh, desire to manage penetrating trauma non-operatively as well. And 
there are small theories that are out there that show that up to 50% of stab wounds and up to 40% of gunshot wounds can successfully be managed non-operatively. So this is where I may disagree with the European guidelines uh, at times. This is not as successful for high velocity rounds. Um, and it's also you know, be harder to do for uh, gunshots that are at close range. Uh, any sort of gunshot that has um, passed sort of through the uh, abdominal viscous organs, you worry about, um, you know, colonic seeding and things like that and subsequent infection. So you, you probably are not going to be successful there. But if you have the case where there is a, uh, just, a, just a kidney injury uh, and a bullet in the kidney, um, you know, a bullet is extremely hot. One would argue it's as hot as cautery. Um, and if it hasn't made any contact with the feces, you could leave it in the kidney parenchyma and it's not going to cause any issues. Um, uh, and you could tr at least initially try non-operative management. Uh, you know, in the extremely rare case of a bullet that ends up in the collecting system and you worry about, is it going to form stones in the future? Uh, you know, that is a question mark. Um, and I would argue that it's probably... Uh, you know, uh, something that doesn't have to be treated in the acute trauma setting, uh, especially if the patient has a simultaneous kidney uh, hematoma, uh, it may not be the best to disturb that in order to try to dig out a, kid, uh, a bullet from the uh, renal parenchyma. But there isn't really a, a good sort of evidence-based literature on that particular situation, only to say that more and more centers are trying to manage all renal traumas, even penetrating renal traumas, with at least initially conservative management. And then, you know, these trauma guidelines are filled with the idea of bed rest. Um, and th that is sort of one of those dogmas within medicine that, ah, yes, well, if we strap people to a bed, then they'll be less likely to stir up bleeding in the kidney. Uh, and that may or may not be true. This is a study of almost 500 patients that had a mixed slew of injuries. But essentially, they sort of randomized people to, uh, you know, what day they should start walking. And there wasn't any real difference in the risk of delayed hemorrhage. Um, and so, you know, I think in the pediatric literature, uh, this has been a tested a little more rigorously, and I, I don't, it's really hard to put a kid on bed rest, so I, I don't think they've been successful and the patients do relatively fine. So bed rest may be uh, something that we do uh, that is going to go uh, towards the wayside. In fact, you could envision a future for a patient with a low-grade renal injury to be sort of discharged home with a few lab draws um, just to catch anything crazy from happening. Um, and, but, you know, I think currently most centers keep these patients in-house for three days and uh, check their hemoglobin, and that may not be um, an appropriate use of medical resources, given the data that we have that says that the vast majority of these patients, vast, vast majority of these patients, absolutely nothing happens if you have the appropriate grade. So we do a lot of IR embolization. This is a, a study by my mentor, Dr. Breyer, uh, showing that these um, can be successful for grade four injuries. Um, and you can, you know, find the area of uh, blush, if you will, and you're able to put coils in to stop active bleeding. This is obviously something that's done pretty commonly after partial nephrectomies, if there's any bleeding after that. Um, and so a similar thing can be done for these cases of trauma. This, in this case, this is a grade five renal laceration. And this is a case report where, uh, you know, because the patient uh, was uh, not deemed an operative candidate, you know, normally you would consider doing a, a trauma nephrectomy here, but they able, were able to manage this bleeding with, uh, with coils. Um, and so, you know, the objective here is not that you're going to save any kidney parenchyma, but the objective here is that you're going to be able to stop the ongoing bleeding, and you're going to be able to avoid making a huge incision on the patient. Um, and certainly there is a risk of reperfusion injury or, you know, the fact that you're leaving sort of a, a devascularized kidney in there. Uh, but you, in the short term, may be avoiding a trip to the operating room. So the real controversy within these uh, rating, uh, within, within the treatment of renal trauma, is what to do about these grade three to five injuries. Which one of those are really going to need intervention? Which one of those are, are not? Um, and so that's where most of the work has been ongoing in terms of uh, this space. And I wanted to share with you some of that a more, free, more recent work. So um, these two groups sort of independently looked at this question and looked in their own uh, institutions to decide which high-grade blunt renal injuries are going to require some sort of intervention. And they, they identified these various factors, uh, a medially located hematoma, peripheral rim distance of greater than 25 millimeters, active extravasation, 
or uh, transfusion. You, some of these factors were shared amongst the studies, some of them were not. Um, and then uh, Dr. Pruitt and company out of Texas uh, similarly looked into their grade four injuries and they proposed that grade four injuries should be subdivided into a low risk group. Uh, I get the phone call, but I'm a urologist. I can stay in bed and go back to sleep versus a high risk group. Ah, I got to get on the phone and get IR and get the OR ready. Um, and so they identified in about 100 patients similar attributes as the prior studies uh, that uh, perirenal hematoma rim distance, they used a 35 millimeter cutoff um, if there was any contrast extravasation or again, a medial laceration of the kidney. And so on their analysis, they found that the an intervention for patients with all three of these factors had an odds ratio of 26. So uh, almost certainty uh, that with these three factors, that patient was going to need something done. Um, so how do you define uh, what a medial laceration is, what the rim distance is? So, you know, first you make a straight line through the hilum here, and then perpendicular to that line, you draw another line. And so if the uh, renal laceration is on the medial side of this line over here, you would call it medial. Uh, and obviously the, the opposite is true. So over here it's lateral. So this, I would just find this as a lateral laceration. Uh, I also would uh, let you know that the peripheral rim distance you calculate by finding sort of the thickest part of the hematoma and you find the edge of the parenchyma here and the edge of the hematoma here and you measure a straight line. Uh, I don't have a ruler on my PowerPoint here, but I assume this is, you know, slightly above 35 millimeters. So this patient has one of the risk factors identified. Um, and the other thing that's, that wasn't present on our other CT scans is a laceration. So here, see how this, the, uh, the intensity of the uh, hematoma seems to go through the kidney parenchyma and you, you lose the brightness. So this, in my mind, is a laceration uh, and it was lacking on, in, in our case, which is why I didn't say it was a grade two injury. Um, so uh, there's uh, a multi-institutional uh, general urinary trauma study group headed out of uh, Utah, and they sort of looked at these prior reports and they wanted to validate this in a larger uh, group of patients. And so they looked in about 300 patients and they tried to similarly identify factors that could predict uh, the need for intervention. And, and they, they saw the same things. Uh, you know, a few, a few additional ones like a greater number of lacerations, but essentially there's something to you know, ongoing extrav, a large hematoma rim distance, and the location that seems to predict for the need to intervene. So now let's get back to our patient story. We're no longer an emergency room physician. We're actually a urologist. So it was two in the morning and we're all comfortable in bed, uh, sleeping our merry dreams. And uh, we get a phone call about this patient. And, you know, somebody texts us a terrible looking small image of the kidney. Uh, here's looking at you. He, he, he. And, uh, and we, you know, we say to ourselves, okay, well, what should we do about this? Does this patient have any risk factors by imaging? Um, and, you know, so again, I, I don't see any laceration here. I think this is a grade one. So arguably these high risk factors don't even apply to the situation. Uh, but if you were to draw a line here and here, I would say this is primarily a lateral laceration. And if you were to measure here to here, uh, again, I would say that it is, uh, it, it, it's, you know, maybe, you know, 30 uh, millimeters. But because it's a grade one laceration, my, my uh, thought process is that this is not ultimately going to be an issue for this patient. Uh, and especially if they have normal vitals, uh, I would not be concerned about the need for operative intervention and I would go to sleep. But that's not the situation that we found ourselves in in real life. Uh, the phone call was about this patient, but this was what it was about. It was, you know what, I'm going into the operating room right now. I'm going to do an exploratory laparotomy on this guy. I'm worried that the kidney is the cause of all the problems. I'm thinking about infrectomy. They got eight units of blood in the last four hours. Their BP is 60 over 40. Their heart rate is elevated and they're on three pressors. Can you help me? So this is a very different situation. Um, and uh, so we're going to have to make a decision. This is what my daughter does when you ask her to make a decision. But you have 10 years of post-collegiate education under your belt. So hopefully you can be a little more uh, nuanced about it. So you know, what are the indications for a trauma nephrectomy? So absolutely, if you see a pulsatile retroperitoneal hematoma, you should do something. If you see or know or have an imaging that suggests that the renal pedicle has been avulsed, you're going to need to do something. If someone has life-threatening shock or hemorrhage from the kidney, you're going to have to do something. And then if someone has a UPJ, a disruption or avulsion, you should fix that. 
Uh, relative indications are, you know, continued urinary extrav without any viable tissue. Uh, you know, it's hard to stent a complete uh, UPJ disruption and expect that urine leak to gonna go away. Uh, if someone has concurrent colon pancreas or some other trauma expiration and they have a grade three or greater concurrent renal injury, you should explore it. Um, persistent or worsening renal vascular hypertension, usually that presents in a delayed fashion, uh, the uh, Goldblatt kidney or something of that nature, or someone that has failed an embolization to protect against hemorrhage. So what do you do if you find yourself in the OR and there's no prior CT scan? Uh, you can do a one-shot trauma IVU. Uh, you do a two mgs per kg body weight of standard contrast, and then a uh, KUB essentially 10 minutes later. Uh, and the blood pressure has to be reasonable in order for this to be effective. What's the point of this? Well, you know, if you are trying to consider a nephrectomy versus, a, you know, a Hail Mary uh, kidney salvage operation, uh, it's nice to know whether they have a contralateral kidney, because then it's a lot easier to say, you know what, let's just do a nephrectomy here, uh, because that's safer for the patient. Um, you know, if it's a solitary kidney situation, you know, then you might alter your plan. Uh, you might get some additional assistance that you no might not normally call into the OR um, because basically it's this or dialysis. Um, and so this information can be helpful in a, in a real emergency where they haven't been able to image. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about nephrectomy. Um, so these are two um, abstracts. They, as, of, as of my recent PubMed searching, they have not been published as of yet. So they have not officially been peer reviewed outside of a meeting. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's very uh, uh, important data that I should share with you. Uh, Dr. Anderson uh, presented this at the Turns Academic Meeting in 2019, um, but he used a, a, a national trauma data bank to look at uh, the impact of nephrectomy or mortality. And so for about 43,000 grade three to five injuries, there was a 6.4% overall mortality rate in that group. But for those patients that got a nephrectomy, the mortality rate was 16% versus five or about 6% for those patients that didn't have a nephrectomy. And obviously there was a multivariate uh, analysis that corrected for the injury severity, their Glasgow coma score, the number of transfusions, the mechanism of injury, the blood pressure, the trauma score, you know, as many things as you can uh, in the caveat that this is still a retrospective database level analysis. And um, uh, nephrectomy did still convey an increased odds of mortality. So it's very interesting. Um, similar study uh, by uh, Serena Kahani out of Utah, who I think, congratulations, recently matched to the residency program there. Uh, he was going to present this at AUA this year, and he did a very similar study in the, in the MyGuts uh, group, uh, and they similarly found that there was a 21% uh, uh, mortality in the nephrectomy group versus 6.5% in the non-nephrectomy group, and this held for univariable, multivariable, and even when excluding for patients that had early death, uh, it still was a very impressive uh, impact on mortality. So, you know, from a physiology standpoint, this should make sense. For someone with multi-organ trauma, uh, you know, it's not good if they lose half their nephrons. That's not good for overall mortality. Um, and so keeping this in the back of your mind, it's not, you know, it, it, certainly it's easy, uh, you know, technically for us to do nephrectomy. And sometimes it's the easier answer to do nephrectomy. Uh, but it may not be the best course of action for our patients. So if we are going to do a trauma nephrectomy, how, how do we do it? Um, you know, often there's a hematoma back in the retroperitoneum. You can't feel or see normal structures. If you can get the uh, pulsations of the aorta, just cut right down on top of the aorta and follow it to the renal vessels. Sometimes you have to use the IMV uh, and know that uh, just medial to that, I can make an incision um, and get down to the vessels. Uh, you know, the, the school of thought typically for trauma nephrectomies is you do want to get control of the hilum before you open um, the rotus uh, because it can be difficult to control the, um, the, the ongoing blood loss if you immediately go for opening up the rotus and you don't know where the hilum is. It also, by doing this, you allow you to easily convert from some sort of salvage operation to a nephrectomy in uh, literally seconds because you already have the vessels isolated and you can throw a stapler in there or whatever method you'd like to use to, to uh, get the kidney out. Um, so for salvage operations, it's important to um, try to keep as much neighboring tissues around as possible for, e for aiding closure, whether that's viable gerotas, whether that's omentum. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes you'll find that a, a, a partial nephrectomy 
or hemi-nephrectomy is the easiest way to uh, kind of get rid of the problem area. You want to make sure to remember that any uh, suture that's in contact with the urinary collecting system has to be absorbable suture. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the ample use of product, whether it be gel foam or, uh, you know, whatever is your uh, soup du jour uh, to help with uh, blood loss can be helpful. But ultimately, now it's time for us to make a decision about our patient that fell off the cliff. Uh, and, uh, you know, we go, the first thing you need to do now in times of COVID is you got you to get dressed appropriately, uh, put your pants on, uh, get your, uh, your whole suit on. Uh, and then, you know, we're used to doing cystos without masks and things. Uh, I saw this circulating on Twitter uh, to help to explain to the urologist why a mask might be useful. Um, so, you know, if, you, if everyone's running around naked when someone pees on you, you're going to get wet. But if you're wearing pants, you'll get less wet. And if everybody's wearing pants, then only the person that pees gets wet. So I found this was good. I don't know who wrote this, uh, but it is uh, quite uh, good for the times here. Um, so once you get clothing on, once you get your mask on, you go into the OR, and in this case, I saw a soft retroperitoneum. I didn't see any expanding or pulsatile hematoma. There was minimal bleeding in the pelvis, probably associated from his uh, lower extremity uh, um, injury. There was no evidence of any bleeding elsewhere. And during the case, the blood pressure was going up and down and up and down, seemingly very uh, oddly. Um, so. I think I've planted enough seeds throughout this lecture that um, to, to, for a trail of breadcrumbs to suggest that I don't think that we should be taking this kidney out. Uh, but it can be really hard to change the trajectory of a uh, sort of, uh, of, the, of the trauma team, uh, of the whole sort of uh, apparatus that's been put into motion to get this kidney out. Um, and uh, that being said, it's really important you know, that we keep the patient's best interest in mind you know, certainly we could do a nephrectomy, but in this case, and in some cases, maybe like this case, I don't know that it would help the patient, uh, and I don't know that it's really uh, the best case uh, scenario. So how do you sort of change the uh, sort of the momentum of that Mack truck? Uh, so here's a little lesson on soft skills of dealing with someone maybe who's more senior than you in the operating room who has a different uh, plan or desire for you. So I like to kill it with kindness. I usually try to uh, put the problem on me. You know, I, I'm confused about this. Help me understand. You want to look for commonalities. You can use some, you know, some great uh, verbiage to kind of help get everyone in the, in the room on your side. Let's partner up to do what's best for the patient. I want to work together with everyone here to get this done. You want to be a good listener, in my opinion. It doesn't do you a lot of good to run into the room and say, I completely disagree with the plan here get your hands off the patient. It's probably not gonna be a suitable approach. And then I like to use questions to kind of uh, get the other parties to, to see the conclusion as I see it. So how does the fact that there's no expanding hematoma affect your thoughts here? How does the fact that there's no ongoing blood loss from the kidney affect your facts here? How, let's, can you, what is your understanding of the CT scan findings? And ultimately I think you can, you can make some uh, some changes, or maybe the other party will be able to um, uh, convince you that actually your initial thoughts were wrong. But either way, I think that uh, there is a way to navigate this uh, tricky situation. So ultimately, I, I was very pleased in this case uh, that we were able to, uh, I was able to convince the team that we shouldn't open Dorotas, um, and systolics did remain quite labile during the case. The patient didn't require any transfusions afterwards. Uh, Post-op day one, their heart rate was still elevated. Their systolics were still sort of all over the place. They had a normal TTE. Their hemoglobin ultimately was stable. Their pressors were weaned. They were put on bed rest, and they did develop a DVT related to our kidney situation. Uh, and then sort of to figure out what happened with the kidney, we decided to do another CT scan. Um, and as you'll be able to see here, it looks very similar to the one that was done, you know, around uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, after um, the blood loss seemed high. Um, and so, uh, again, I think you can see pretty nicely on this one because of the contrast, there's really no evidence of laceration. Uh, and this looks like a grade one renal laceration. So, you know, in a typical situation with more normal vitals, I would not have in any way suggested this patient needed intervention. So it still leads to the question, what was going on with the blood pressure? Well, all sorts of things that could have been going on. Uh, you know, uh, 
could have been withdrawal, could have been some sort of barrel reflex failure. Uh, but this patient fell from 30 feet. So, you know, spinal cord injury, about a third of those are due to falls. Um, and so, you know, falls is, uh, can lead to neurogenic shock, which is, which is a type of distributive shock. And that can lead to all sorts of alterations in a patient's uh, vital signs and ability to maintain blood pressure. Um, and so this can present in a delayed fashion. Uh, you know, if you read the textbook, although none of our patients read the textbook, they present with bradycardia and hypotension. Problem is if someone has lost a lot of blood from a renal hematoma and from uh, you know, broken bones, it can confuse the picture quite a bit. And the, what is happening here is that potassium is lost from the spinal cord cells. There's a blunted response to resuscitation. Usually pressors are the treatment of choice. Um, and again, textbook says that systolics will be less than 100, heart rate will be less than 80. Uh, it will happen within four hours of injury and then you should manage with pressors. What happens to the kidney long-term? What do we need to watch out for for patients that have renal trauma? So this uh, study by Osterberg et al. Uh, suggests that hypertension is a long-term issue for these patients. So they looked at 163 patients with kidney trauma matched to 62 patients that had trauma but not kidney trauma. And those patients with kidney trauma were more likely to have new onset hypertension, uh, higher grade injury in, incurred a higher risk. And those patients with a medial laceration had a higher risk, probably because it's affecting the hilum, which is where the mechanism of blood pressure sort of is housed. Um, and then, you know, we're talking a lot about conservative management. What happens to these kidneys long-term if you are able to salvage them without any sort of operation? So if you look at grade four injuries, uh, you know, a few months after injury uh, in this single study, single center study, they had about a 40% relative function by DMSA. Um, grade five in their study actually had 0% medial relative, media rel relative function. Um, and so, uh, you know, the grade five injuries, what you may be doing is just avoiding a surgery. You may not be, you know, uh, saving any nephrons. Um, but I think we need a, much more data in this space to understand, you know, what are the impacts of these uh, sort of more surveillance type strategies that have only been developed in the last 20 or years or so. Uh, and the data is just not mature yet to know how this affects people long term. I want to thank all the mentors that have uh, helped me uh, throughout my journey. Uh, was, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was in the shoes that you guys are in. Uh, and so uh, it's only because of uh, the patience of these individuals that I'm able to give a lecture here to the COVID community of urologists. Um, and uh, feel free to fill out the survey. And thank you very much for your time. I think uh, we're going to do questions now. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for a great talk, Dr. Cohen. And uh, thank you for clearing up my misconceptions about the Glasgow Coma Score. Uh, we do have um, a few questions from the audience and I'll, we'll sort of pick and choose some of these. So uh, first question, what's the grading for a shattered kidney and is that an indication to start antibiotics? Yeah, so a shattered kidney, you know, it, typically a shattered kidney is still sort of a grade five injury. This would be a kidney that has sort of uh, multiple lacerations, typically has a major vascular uh, injury. Um, you know, it, it, sort of deter it sort of depends on your sort of definition or use of the word shattered. Um, you know, it's better to use the characteristics of the grading scale to ascribe the, um, the grade um, based on the attributes there. Uh, because, you know, uh, older urologists or radiologists will throw around the term shattered, but, um, you know, it's really the characteristics of the grading scale that matters. Um, the use of antibiotics for the, in, in um, sort of renal trauma is an important question. Certainly, if someone has had a trauma, you know, penetrating trauma that has uh, crossed a viscous organ, Antibiotics are certainly very reasonable uh, because of the concern of seeding of the urinary tract. Uh, you know, certainly if someone has extravasation and fevers and ongoing urinoma, antibiotics are reasonable. In a typical uh, sort of uh, renal trauma, blunt trauma case, uh, there's no strong um, sort of need for antibiotics. So I, I don't typically start patients on antibiotics for a blunt injury. Great. Uh, we have a question regarding an intra-op question. So if there's no C-arm and the blood pressure has been low and the one shot I, or the one shot I've used non-diagnostic, how do you proceed in that case? You have, to, you have to proceed so that you can help your patient. So, I mean, the bottom line in all these situations is if you have a patient that is crashing uh, and the blood pressure is low, uh, irrespective of, you know, that takes 10 minutes, right? So if, you, if your anesthesiologist says, you know, this patient doesn't have 10 minutes, then you have to take the kidney out. And if it turns out they had a solitary kidney, then 
you know, dialysis is going to be the answer. Uh, but you, you can't, um, you know, you can't um, trade a patient's life for, you know, uh, more knowledge. You know, any situation where you didn't have a CT scan, you're already in a dire strait uh, because we can pretty much stabilize a whole lot of stuff these days in order to get a CT scan before the OR. Um, so, you know, you, you have to do what's best for the patient. Great. A uh, question about your thoughts regarding the novel use of renal Teflon trauma bags for grade yeah. four and five renal injuries and their yeah, re so, reliable study. So I, I don't have any personal experience with that, but I think that that, that is a very exciting area. Uh, and uh, and I, I too need to learn more. So I, I'm not aware of any sort of um, uh, high quality studies that uh, would enable me to sort of incorporate that in my practice. Uh, I think at the moment that's sort of a, a site by site experience. Uh, and I'd love to see more data uh, presented about that um, technology. Great. A couple questions regarding uh, repeat imaging. So what's your timing for repeat imaging for the high-grade renal wax? Great question. So I use, so first of all, um, a point that almost always is true is the initial CT scan almost never has delayed imaging. And so a, a, an often a conundrum is, well, we have a high-grade injury. The initial scan didn't have delayed imaging. I don't know if they're having urinary extrav or whatnot. Do I need to get a delayed image now or can I wait to get a repeat image? My argue, argument is if the patient doesn't have fevers or flank pain or anything, it's safe to wait. And I usually wait 48 hours for that repeat scan. Uh, and you just have to make sure that the repeat scan is appropriate and that one it has delays. Um, and so uh, I don't sort of, uh, you know, automatically eight hours after the first scan get it scan with delays. I usually, if the patient's okay, it's safe to wait that sort of 48 hours to let the patient declare themselves. Great. Um, a follow-up to that, are there any phases that you can omit given timing if someone doesn't have an arterial phase in that scenario? Is that okay to sort of skip? Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to decide based on the situation that has, uh, you know, the situation in front of you, right? So if a patient... <coughs> If a patient has a, a grade four injury and, um, and they had, a, you know, let's say that you, you applied your criteria and they had a high risk grade four injury on the initial scan. And so they actually went for IR embolization um, and, and then their, uh, all of their uh, vital signs have stabilized um, and, you know, they're doing fine and, and whatnot. I think at that point, it's probably safe to do just a non-con scan. Um, to see if, you know, there's any increase in the hematoma um, in it. You know that they've had, they went to IR and there's been, they've been embolized. So you don't necessarily need to reload them with contrast in order to make that assessment. Um, it, similarly, if you happen to get a scan that had delayed, that didn't have any signs of extravasation in a blunt trauma situation, it's probably unlikely for them to develop delayed uh, extravasation. Um, and if they have no flank pain, if they have no sort of signs or symptoms of that. So probably, again, in that situation that you could probably omit the delayed imaging uh, for, for those situations. Okay, and th this question is sort of along the similar lines for patients whose GFR doesn't handle a contrast study when you're doing the repeat. It sounds like you're okay with just a non-con study. Depending yeah, on I mean, you always have to, you have to keep in mind the patient's attributes and you got to keep in mind the, the clinical picture, right? So uh, the, the guidelines are guidelines, but they're, you know, for um, each situation, you have to make the best decision for the patient in front of you. Um, and um, and uh, certainly these considerations are, are important. We have a couple of questions here regarding um, follow-up and following patients after discharge. So how long do you follow these patients and do you have a follow-up protocol for them? So it can be, it can be particularly diff difficult to, to get follow-up for these patients. You know, trauma patients, uh, at least in my experiences, you know, the insurance doesn't necessarily match up with the hospital that they end up at. So you can treat them in, in, in hospital, but then ultimately they're not able to follow up with you in clinic. Um, and so for that situation, at least it's prevalent in the United States, um, it's really important to communicate with the primary care doctor. Um, and I focus on the idea of hypertension. Um, and so I really, you know, try to make sure that the PCP is going to be uh, following up and checking on that especially in a patient where they otherwise wouldn't go uh, see a doctor except for maybe a physical every two, three years. Uh, you really want to communicate the importance of checking for hypertension. Otherwise, I do not have any standard protocol for repeat imaging um, or uh, sort of uh, anything of that nature. 
Um, and to my knowledge, there's not anything established in the literature about if these patients would benefit from a, uh, you know, an ultrasound scan down the road. Um, I think it's an interesting question um, for those patients, particularly with urinary extrav. Is there a risk of silent obstruction, stricture formation? I don't know that anyone really knows or studied that yet. Okay, perfect. Well, we're out of time. We'll send the remaining questions to Dr. Cohen to post on our website, but I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and thank you again, Dr. Cohen, for a wonderful talk. Please again, fill out the evaluations, even if you filled them out before, we'd like to keep tracking on how we can keep improving the lecture series and uh, thank you all again. All right, it's a pleasure, everyone. Thank you.